not visible, not valued, not viable. Four friends discuss over coffee some key themes arising from the concepts of not visible, not valuable, not viable. Up next, in No Labels, No Walls, We Are One Festival 2020. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Amiri. I'm Alison. I'm Gail. And I'm Morag. Um, we're going to have a coffee and we're really glad that you can join us. So this is what we're um, going to have a wee look at tonight. We're going to have a wee um, look at a number of areas, not visible, not vi valuable and not viable. So we're going to just explore a few questions under each of those headings. So under not visible, what makes things visible to you, but they remain visible to others? And how visible were those in shielding? And then in reporting the deaths uh, resulting from COVID, there was an emphasis on underlying health conditions. How did that make you feel? And what did you think about that? And the first thing that strikes me about the whole idea of of um, being visible is about even if you think you're visible sometimes you're completely invisible always reminds me of the the time Morag and I were actually um, had a coffee and then we realized that one of the big stores had a sale on so we jumped into the the store we each bought things and we're standing at the cash desk and uh, the woman Morag paid for her so I paid for mine and the woman said to Morag do you want your receipt in your bag Morag's eye, that's fine. And then this, the woman at the cash desk right beside turns around and says to me, do you want your wee receipt in your bag? And you know that head cock to the side that just like, do you want your wee receipt? Like really patronising. And seeing mm -hmm. those times, I feel really invisible and it drives me absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I certainly remember that. That instant in her saying, do you want your wee receipt in your wee bag? That's and true. that was... Um, you know, a bit of an eye opener for me because although I had uh, uh, had a stick, I wasn't in a chair, so I didn't get the same patronising response as you got, Anne Marie. I know it's quite bizarre. Um, just that whole thing about feeling like you're really you're, you're invisible as a person. You're visibly there because they can see and they can see your chair, but you're com completely invisible as a person. Mm. So what makes things visible to you, but they remain invisible to others? Why do you think that is? I guess, I guess the, well, I guess we all have times when we're um, preoccupied and thinking of other things. And so you're not always kind of aware of everything around you. Um, so I think there's maybe some situations like, like that as well, where people are just not necessarily taken in. Um, their surroundings and the general public because uh, you know, so if you when you're walking down a street and if there was if there was somebody in need of or appearing as though they were in some kind of distress would some people stop and help or would other people walk by because they were worried or anxious or you know that, that something was going to happen to them if they stopped I think there's maybe situations like that as well where, where some people would automatically do something and others would be too too afraid or just too wary, too wary, wary of it. Yeah, so I guess it might not just be because you have a disability then, there's a wider context about citizenship in there and about helping each other, isn't there? I think sometimes people can be, sometimes people can become so blinkered and particularly during this COVID season where people are have been concerned about their own health and their own well-being and their own jobs and and their own securities and everything that went along with that. So when, when that's kind of blinkered in, people there may be aware of the impact, for example, of people who were shielding, people who were basically locked away for three, four months. So it was kind of out of sight, out of mind, invisible 
um, while people focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly I was one of those shielded people and it did feel at times that you were a bit invisible or else you were an afterthought. You know that whole thing about telling everybody what the rules are and all the rest of it and then it was a bit like and those of you that are in shielding will come back to you or just stay where you are and keep safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stay, stay out of the way, stay out of the way. <laughs> Stay out, the way in, stay out of the way in case anything happens. I know, but do you think people get a sense of what that was like to be um, in, uh, in that kind of shielded position and kind of invisible to, the, to others during that time? I don't know. I was somebody who was shielding as well, so I don't know how that was perceived by others, but it was certainly, um, I think, probably a bit later in the in the time that we're shielding when it got some prominence in the media i think it took the media quite a long time to um if you like catch up with the fact that that was that was happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. It definitely wasn't an easy time sorry Austin, were you going to say something yeah, yeah. so you go um yeah i think it i think it is it's, it was it, it was. It was. Too, I think there was too much unknown for people. It was too. Everything was too new. And I, you know, the, I think there was that whole bit about well, people didn't really know or understand, so they were just kind of going along or doing what they were told, and and that you know that was it. It wasn't. It wasn't easy to understand what was happening to other people. Mm. Mm -hmm. But what about that whole idea with the emphasis being on? Um, these people who've lost their lives and died to COVID have got an underlying health problem. That almost made me feel like um, as if it was okay that they died because actually they had an underlying health problem and it was kind of, you know, that was their fault and that's just how it happened and it kind of legitimised it in some way. I, I didn't feel that about it. I didn't feel uh, that. I think really it was, again, about a kind of media focus and presentation on what, what it was like for the mainstream and not what it was like for people who were other and I think it was about uh, a kind of reassurance of the the public widely that uh, really they wouldn't come to harm that it was that was happening to other people um, and I think in some ways that gave a kind of worrying sub message as well that actually it was okay for other people to be you know, out there and engaging things. And I think that became problematic later on as lockdowns became became lifted. I think there was less of a recognition that it affected and potentially could affect everybody. But I don't think it was, um, if you like, as harsh as that. I think it was really about how the media continued to present that as, um, you know, as everybody else was, you know, you know, okay, it wasn't really affecting you. It was only affecting these people with, underlying health conditions yeah i think i think i just remembering and i, I <clears throat> listening to the one of the reports on the news yesterday and it was again saying that um when they were talking about young people and how they've always said for quite a number of weeks or months that young people aren't as affected um or wouldn't be as affected wouldn't become as unwell if they caught covid um but just in that particular news item, what they were saying was that the the young people who have sadly passed away, um, again, it came out just recently, they were saying, um, however, they did have underlying health conditions. So again, it does feel like that, that again, it's, it's happened. It, it, People, it maybe makes people worry less or think less or be concerned less about what would happen if they caught it because they don't have an underlying health condition. Does that then make it people too rec a wee bit reckless in yeah. their behaviour? I, you know, I don't know. It may or may not make people reckless or it might just be that people think, well, thank goodness that's not me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think while it may have made others feel relieved, I can't... As somebody who has underlying health conditions, I think that I found that pretty frightening and I can't imagine how terrifying I would feel if I mm -hmm. had been a parent or was a parent of a child with an underlying health condition. I think I would find mm -hmm. that really, you know, pretty terrifying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it must have had an impact on people who then, when they were told to come out of shielding, um, that it was all okay. No wonder you would hear of people and know people that just didn't want to take a step over the door. Yeah, absolutely. But, do you know, it's, it's, 
Mm -hmm. I, th I think as well, some of the measures that have been put in place for the general, the wider public, for the total public to um, sort of manage social distancing and everything, if you've got some kind of sensory impairments or stuff like that, that that's not going to mean anything to you. It's, got, you that, it's irrelevant to you. So I was in Dundee and they had special markings on the pavement trying to kind of lead people, you know, in, on two separate sides of the street. And I think it was big smiles or something. It wasn't like, well, this way. They actually tried to do it quite nicely. But if you had a visual impairment or, or, or that didn't make sense to you, you didn't understand what that was, <clears throat> you're not going to be able to, to respond to that. And then you risk the wrath of other people who think you are deliberately trying to... Um, be obstructive or be difficult so mm. it was like there wasn't a count taken of other people you know the whole population mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i had that experience alison on a street where it was all one way but actually there was no way you could go off the, the, the curb if you were to follow the one way signs so in a wheelchair you were i was stuck on a, a power chair not being able to go off the the, the, the pavement at all um, because of, and, and also because of the way people were, um, you know, queuing up the side of the roads. It was just quite odd. So I think you're right for, for a whole range of reasons. I'm just conscious of time, ladies. Will we move on to the second question? Okay. And this is in our section on not valuable. Why is it that people with a disability who are seen to be successful are defined as exceptional or inspirational? And how can we think about reframing concepts of diversity to actively refocus on rights and equality? For example, who decides uh, who is the diverse members of any group? Where does that power lie? Good question. Well, again, I have always had a bit of a debate about this because I like the use of the word diversity. And I, in my head, it conjures up all sorts of things about a whole range of different people. And you've got a different view on that. And I understand your view. Tell me about it. Well, it's really, as um, we've talked about before, is about who decides who are the routine members of a group and who are sometimes in cases brought in to be seen as the the diverse members of a group and i would prefer to see a focus being on people's rights to be present uh and the equality of being being present and i think i i just had some concerns that um that that can be diluted and we don't focus on on rights and equality yeah yeah that's understandable. I guess it's like, you know, the whole idea of the kind of tokenistic gesture of, you know, somebody with a, dif with a disability, somebody with a different ethnic background. But in all of that thing, where does the power lie in all these relationships? And as you say, who decides who the other group members are and who the non-other group members are? I, I agree. I mean, I do. You've, you've actually altered my thinking about that, I have to say. Mm. And, and how much of it is it just a pure tick folks and exercise for the organisers or those with the power um, to say, well, actually, we made sure we've got a handful of diverse, inverted commas, people sitting at the table, so we've ticked that box. But there are so many people who are in our communities who the, the prospect of sitting at a table and speaking the language that's spoken at these tables where big decisions are made it would be so alien and terrifying and they're never anywhere near it and they're unlikely to be ever anywhere near it because nobody adapts how they do things or they adapt very slightly. So the system excludes people even though there are stated aims to be inclusive, I would suggest. So, so does that mean that those individuals are not deemed to be valuable? Or are they only valuable because it ticks a tick box that says they happen to be there? Because, because again, there's that thing, isn't there, about when, for example, if you've got a disability and you 
you happen to be successful at something, then everybody gives it, you know, oh God, you're really inspirational. How can you know just be ordinary and be be seen for who you are without people thinking that you've had to do or that you are something really special because you've managed to get a bit of a life and make a good go of it? It's quite mm -hmm. a nod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose it's that kind of thing because you've managed to you've managed to overcome your <laughs> your um, I don't know your deficit. Is it you know? So that's the you know. Is that that's I don't think people say that, but do you know what I mean? It's it, there must be that kind of underlying view that some people might have that. So how you well, have, can you have a wee deficit? I <laughs> could. <laughs> And you've come, you've overcome your wee deficit. That's really, really good. Be patting the head for you. Uh -huh. I don't listen. I've had it. I'll tell you. There's some of these uh, wonderful stores that you go in and folks say, you know, you're packing up your groceries, groceries, and they say, "Is that you going for a wee cup of tea?" And you actually want to say, "No, I'm actually going off to university because I've got a chapter to write up at my PhD or something." But they would just die a shock, so you just smile graciously and walk away with steam mm. coming out your ears. And actually, I remember doing that. The PA was with me, tapped me in the head because she saw exactly what happened. So it was a bit of a hoot. But it, these kind of things happen all the time. So mm. it's like, how do you, how can you, as a person who may have a long-term condition or a disability or something? Just be recognised for the person you are without having to be either, you know, just just because you exist. You know, you're valuable because you exist. Or put in a, in a box, Anne-Marie, I'm reminded of that experience of that meeting that we were at, where we were challenging people, we were challenging the organiser about the lack of um, representation. Yes. And... They at some point just said, but it's fine because we've got Anne Marie here. <laughs> I'm a service user. I know, and I'm like, I didn't know I was there because I was a service user. It's like, and it's like rolling you out on the stage, you know, just roll you out the stage and you go, hi, and then you take you back again behind the curtain. So nobody really sees you, but they think that you've got a role to play because you fit in a wee kind of stereotypical, um, somebody else's stereotypical view of you. That is, mm. it's the, very entertaining at times, I have to say. So what about this whole idea of reframing the concept of diversity? How can we do that? Big question. <laughs> Big question. Big question. Because if we get um, equality right, um, you know, would that then lead us to forget about diversity? If we get rights and equality right, will diversity naturally follow? We might call it something else. Um, rather than diversity, but we get a better range of folk involved if we just if people were just afforded their the human rights and then their opportunities and and mm -hmm. there was a bit of equity about what we did. Mm. I suppose it gets back to some of what Morag was saying um, earlier, just about you can accept people for you know for who they are or or what they are, and you know the sort of face value and um, appreciate appreciate that rather than um rather than as we're saying that you know it's looking like a quota of people you have to have yeah. to be representative in a group because a group won't be a, a viable group mm -hmm. if it doesn't have um x number of you know women males females people of different race or whatever do you know what i mean so mm -hmm. I do think it fundamentally needs to be rights based and people um, have the same and equal right to be wherever there is and have equal value and equal weighting in, in opinion and in development and I think it might be that you need to run interference to make sure that any forum or whatever you're in is actually honouring that right to be there. But it's there as a right, not as an invitation by others mm. to mm. be there. It's about your absolute right to be part of society and part of that. Yeah, yeah. And can I just say as well, and it's an overused term, lived experience, the fact that there's a seem to be a bit of a tokenistic we should, we will have some people with lived experience who are informing folk 
whatever the development might be, surely the core is the lived experience. Surely the people with lived experience who's, who are living these lives are the people who should be informing policy and legislation and changes and developments and all of that, surely. Well, I would have thought so. Um, but um, I'm just thinking about some decisions that have been made recently. Um, with the, the review group, for example, that's going to be looking at the social care review. I was disappointed to realise there was nobody with lived experience involved in that group. I'm sure people will get the opportunity to contribute, but I think it's that bit about um, rather than just contribute, why are you not getting a seat at the table? You know, mm. so I think there's, there's a whole range of stuff in there, isn't there? But it's about how we move away from the kind of gesture of tokenism. Yeah, yeah and how alliances. Uh, our, our power shared yes. and I think in a, in, an, in a true alliance of power sharing then that sometimes means that those who have the power have to give up some of that yes. um, and I think it is about allies and allies in change um, to, to take things forward in, in a way that is more equal yeah mm -hmm. I think you're right Maybe in the new world, when you know, when we get out the other side of COVID, enough things will have changed that far more opportunities will be created for people. But I like what you were saying, Gail, about being viable. It takes us on to our next uh, topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, <clears throat> so looking at uh, not viable. Um, do you think the measure of a country is seen in how it treats all of its citizens? And have we witnessed people having collective responsibility for public health? Or have we, have we witnessed individualism? Uh, I think it depends what day of the week it is around whether you've witnessed individualism or collective responses at was sitting outside a shop and I saw these youngsters going by all with their face masks on and all complying and all the rest of it with what what appeared to be me what appeared to me is complying and then and then I seen various older people walking past no masks on no nothing mm. so oh, I don't know I think it varies yeah yeah I think I think it does I mean I think again I think through the the past five months I've seen um, in situations where people have acted in a quite individual, possibly individualistic, sort of selfish way. Um, and yet people who have also been exceptional in generosity, um, yeah. in either of, you know, giving time or, you know, donating to all sorts of um, individuals that wanted to do fundraising, etc. But they've certainly been huge amounts of generosity develop, come forward as well, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I think that has been the real paradox, is there people who have been exceptional, mm -hmm. uh, who have not stayed with their own families in order to protect them, but while working on the front line in whatever, in whatever capacity. And at yeah. the same time, I think it's been quite tough to, to watch people for whom, you know, they haven't been taking the measures that we would expect them to take. And I suppose I've always thought, there's been a kind of question in my mind about if your life hasn't changed during this, then why not? Yeah. You know, and I think yeah. um, we, we should certainly be celebrating the action of uh, people who did uh, step forward uh, to help either in their employment in uh, NHS or social care or in retail or uh, transport or whatever, but also those who step forward in terms of, um, if you like, a kind of freed up network of community, community action and neighbourhood support. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I was thinking about viability from a different perspective. So I was, what I was thinking about, thinking about it from how viable, viable were we as a country in terms of readiness for the pandemic and all the stuff mm -hmm. that had gone on before. So, you know, that lack of investment in the NHS and in social care for years, not having a stockpile or, or enough, a big enough stockpile of all the PPE, not having, um, you know, having a change of strategy 
partway through, not taking cognizance of all those things that happened in Spain and you've got forewarned and we should have been forearmed and we weren't. So I wonder how viable we were as a society and, and a country prepared for that. And are we going to be able to make our country uh, or make everybody viable for our, in our country and every, in our country viable for everybody? Do you know what I mean? Mm. And obviously I've got your brains thinking there. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just on that, you know, how we make our neighbourhoods, our communities, our, our country more viable kind of theme is that I think it is um, about how we use some of the lessons to build that more uh, viable society for everybody. Yeah. And I think that during the, the COVID experience, there has been real useful lessons in that about how we, how we plan how we think about all uh, all citizens, um, some of the innovations that were made, for example, in homelessness, um, and the discussions around uh, universal basic income. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it would be unfortunate if some of those, um, if you like, signposts to other ways of doing things that COVID has highlighted for us um, are lost. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right, Morag. I think it, there's an opportunity for it to change for every citizen for the better. Mm -hmm. um, and the worry is that that opportunity is not taken and we don't learn the lessons. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think just the fact that the amount of changing of people's work, working, expe working experience, working life, has changed hugely. Um, I, create, I mean, is is one. I think it also creates opportunities as well for for people of um, who have not had the opportunity to work and not been able to participate have got opportunities. I, I should have greater opportunities now if we're doing far more um, on a digital mm -hmm. basis, where you don't need to travel into work, you don't need to have any kind of you know situation there other than being in your own being in your own home and having the right equipment yeah yeah, yeah. so do you think the measure then of uh, a country seeing how it treats all its citizens because it might again it says the was it him that said something about um the measure of a good country is how it treats um its poor people or vulnerable people or something like that i can't quite remember mm -hmm. the phrase but there's something about how we, how any country treats all of its citizens, meaning whether you've mm -hmm. got, you know, additional needs, whether you're homeless, whether you're elderly, some mm -hmm. degree of um, equity or, or some value base, if you like, that's consistent for everybody. Yeah. I think, I think it's not just about it, it, the country's own citizens, it's about global citizens as well, when you think about the, yeah. the, the way that, that refugees have been um, treated and stuff like that. So yeah. I, I think that it's not just about the citizens of the bit of land that you're sitting in, it's actually far broader than that. It's actually yeah, about absolutely. all our brothers and sisters, which sounds a bit hippie-ish, but it's about, you know, it's that age, old that's one. Your, <laughs> that's your age, the hippie bit. I oh, know. Well, <laughs> no, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, think you're right I think I would agree. Uh, yeah, I would agree. And I suppose there's just something, isn't there, about... Um, how it's we almost um, gear all of what we do to that whole middle group of people mm -hmm. and we we don't reach out to those who don't quite fit yeah. in that space yeah mm. and again again it gets back to i don't like to do that but take it back to what you were saying at the beginning but it get back gets back to visibility and who people actually see mm -hmm. and if people if people are um you know if you have um, a disability if you are somebody who's older you know and less able to get out and about or you're in a care home you're you're in these environment you're in that kind of environment where people won't generally see you um because they're they're not mixing in any way but the, you're, if that person's not getting out and not visible yeah. um then that whole visibility is you know is, is key to how people see their, their citizens um, Does that mean that well? not visible? If you're not visible, then the perception is that you're not valuable, 
and if you're not seen to be valuable then you might be perceived as being not viable either mm -hmm. good end to our conversation absolutely absolutely on that bombshell <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, Law, but my teeth cold. <laughs> Absolutely. Same time next week, same place then. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for Bye. coming See along and listening to us. See you. Sleep well. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.